Ah, so what did you want to say? I think it's better we choose them because sometimes. I don't think we have done that. Huh? No, we can choose them. Otherwise, sometimes we get asked some questions. Yeah, yeah, please do. And if, it, if there are other questions in, in uh, Telugu or Russian, they can be good. Give it to me in English. Arrange to give it to me in English. And, yeah, okay. And you want to say, anyway, we've got more questions that we're going to get through here. <laughs> Yeah, Mukunda Data is Okay, let's get on with it. Uh, the first one, I think you can choose one of these. I think I'll answer because it was. Uh, well, I'll tell you why. I'll answer this one in particular. Why did I in ISKCON devotee ignore Srila Prabhupada's maxim of contributing 50% of one's income to spread, for spreading Krishna consciousness? Whereas commonly Christians, Muslims, and even other Vaishnav sects have some standard practice of contributing, therefore, thereby keeping the mission regularly. And that's the end of the question. We're left trailing in linguistic ether. Anyway, we get the gist of the question. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd answer this because. Uh, recently I got an email from one of my god brothers, Dayananda Prabhu, one of Srila Prabhupada's uh, at least he was joined on the west coast and then he was uh, he was a married man I think even when he joined and, uh, which was unusual in those days and he was what we could call a responsible Vrihasta and uh, he was serving in Tehran in the times when Iran was under the Shah and uh, he's very strong on this point. He sent me an email just I think three weeks ago something like that and yeah he's very strong on this point of 50% he said when I, whenever I was earning money I always gave them at least 50% of my income. So he said that I read, he read on my website my standards for initiation, which are more exacting than the minimum standards required in ISCO. Yeah. Should we announce the translation? Russian translation. We got it. They're very good system. It's shortwave radio. Um, so he asked me, that, "Well, do you do this 50 percent? Do you insist on your disciples doing 50 percent?" And uh, I wrote back to him and. I, I said that no, I don't, and that <clears throat> although Srila Prabhupada did speak of this, there's also uh, in one place he says up to 50%, in some places he says at least 50%, and I wrote to him that Srila Prabhupada wrote to Umapati, I didn't find the, I didn't look for the uh, I didn't look for the letter, but in, in one letter Srila Prabhupada said to Umapati one of them, that if you can't get 50%, who is forcing you? And I also said that uh, as most householders these days are struggling just to meet their basic family expenses, if you, if you were to insist on this, then probably many would go away or keep their distance. So, uh, so I wrote, no, I don't insist on it. I, I, I sometimes talk about it. But as far as I see Srila Prabhupada, he, uh, he did mention it often. 
citing Rupa Goswami. But as far as I see, he never insisted on it. And uh, then Dayananda Prabhu wrote back and said, uh, that, well, that's interesting that you mentioned Umapati because he told me once, means Umapati told Dayananda that uh, he had some job and he lost it and Prabhupada said that's because you weren't giving 50%. <laughs> so what do you do? If you want to take it literally, just if you take the case of the Pandavas, that it was said whatever they had to, whatever the, any one of them got, they had to share equally among themselves. So one day Arjuna came back and said, Mother, see what I got today, something very special. And she said, whatever it is, you have to share with all your brothers. It was a wife. Now what would you do if you had to give 50% of it away? Cut your wife in half. Sharing is also unusual, but it's, if you have to give 50%, what do you do? So anyway, that's my answer to that. It, it was, Srila Prabhupada didn't mention it, but he never insisted on it. Uh, cri Christians and Muslims, they have a system. Recently one devotee from Nepal told me how, how uh, there's so much Christianity spreading conversion in Nepal and I said well one reason for that is the so much money is coming in from the West he says no not now initially but not now because they have a system it's called tithing which means you have to, everyone has to give 10% of their income and they do the local newly converted Christians do and they have money which it does help Christian culture spreading is not dependent on income but if we, have, if we have money, then we can hold festivals, distribute prasadam, print books, build temples, and in so many ways. We see that one major factor in Christianity spreading in India is money. It's, a, it's actually a business for many people. They get good payment for every conversion. And uh, Islam also, we find in Kerala, so many mosques came up once the local people went to work in the Gulf and earned so much money. So that's my take on that. Yeah, give. Give all your money to Krishna, or at least 50%. I do. Of course, I don't have a family to support. Yeah, okay, that's that answer in brief. There are only about 20 of them. Ladu Gopal question. Okay. Can I go for it? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I don't think this is working. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. You might not be in the same answer, right? Hare Krishna. Someone can call Mukunda also, ask him to come on. Maybe he's recovering, had a long session this morning. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Well, in the meantime, I'll do another one. Some devotees, when they want to get their children married, insist on college degrees or look for personal wealth or look for matches within their own caste. Please clarify what should be the attitude of the devotee and what about dowry? Uh, as far as caste is concerned, if you can do within the caste, it may be easier, despite it not being... Uh, Bhakti Nautakos. Yeah, Bhakti Nautakos and like that. But it just may make life easier with the relatives and everything else. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough one because Everyone wants, uh, they're looking in marriage, they're looking for degrees and this and that. If you, 
If you join our farm communities, we won't ask for college degrees. There are no college degrees. No colleges, no college degrees. Uh, if, if you can find people who are enlightened enough not to insist on this, then all the better. Otherwise, sending them to the college means very strong chance of their becoming very degraded. The colleges in India are becoming more and more degraded. I remember reading recently a Back to Godhead magazine of Srila Prabhupada written before he came to the West and he was talking about the degradation of the students. There had been some killing, some in the in the university. The principal was trying to discipline the students and they killed him. That was in the 1950s. And nowadays uh, it's not just Punjab. Drugs are everywhere. Punjab has the reputation, but it's everywhere. Illicit sex. So, it's a very bad situation. There's heavy social pressure to send your children to the college. And why are you depriving them? If you're strong in your principles, you can, uh, you can avoid that. The main consideration always has to be spiritual advancement. But as I was saying this morning, there may be so much pressure from relatives. One of our devotees here, he, he from Salem, he had to go to college at the insistence of the grandparents. So he was in college and he counted every single day. How many, how many days have I got left? And he came out and now he's Brahmachari in the temple. He wasted how many, four years or something like that. You can say to people, I have a college degree, if they ask you. So yeah, best to avoid all these things for the sake of spiritual advancement. What about dowry? Well, it is in Shastra. Uh, something can be given. You can give some ornaments to the girl, at least. But again, if the, if the other side is insisting on dowry, then that's not good from their side, if they're, they're trying to squeeze you and this and that. Not good. Not good to be mixed up with such people. But then, what to do in this world? You have to see each individual case. Hare Krishna. Did you get your sound? We got it. Okay. So choose. Hare Krishna. Are you here? Choose your question, huh? Really? Okay. okay, we have a question here. Um, my family wants to worship Ladu Gopal, but I have heard that Vaishnavas don't worship Krishna alone. So what to do? Which is better? Ladu Gopal worship or Gauramitai worship? And why? How many of you have Ladu Gopal deity at home? Nobody will admit. Why not? Yeah. <clears throat> Ladu Gopal is Krishna in the form of a baby. So, in our Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, to my knowledge, where the emphasis, the focus is on Srimadha Rasa, Madhurya Rasa, the development of unfolding of Madhurya. So this Vatsalya Rasa is also there, but it is not so much emphasized in our tradition, uh, except you could say during the month of Dhammada. And then we all celebrate uh, the pastime of Dhammada and Mother Yashoda. 
And so our focus is indeed on worship of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu. One day Sri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sahodita Buddha Daye Ushpavanto Chitra Shando Tamonido. Now we worship these two brothers who appear simultaneously. Uh, like the sun and the moon rising above Yoga Vesha. Why? Because they dispel the darkness of ignorance. Now, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is non different from Lord Krishna. And you could say, so there's no difference between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Madhu Gopal. You could say that in some sense, but there is. Sometimes we make a distinction between what we call tattva and what we call rasa. So tattva may be the same, but rasa will be different. And in the cultivation of bhakti, we are we're all we're all trying to be gardeners, right? We're all trying to uh, cultivate the bhakti vata, the creeper of bhakti. And for that we're making so much, uh, we're, we're, we're being very careful uh, with this delicate plant. And we're doing this on the direction of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who appears together with Nityananda Prabhu to do what? To glorify the Supreme Lord specifically through Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtana And how do we worship Gornitai? We worship Gornitai by doing what? Sri Krishna Sankirtana. Yes, that is the main form of worship. Every deity has a special, a particular type of worship that is pleasing to that form of the Lord. So for Lord Jagannath, it's the offering of Bojana. You know, Chapan Boga, 56 different preparations. Uh, ideally, all day long, Lord Jagannath, what does he do? He, he likes to eat. And what is Chaitan and Radha Krishna? How especially do we worship them? Especially by nice shingar, by ornament, by nice dress, uh, and by a very attentive, um, very attentive attention to the details of Archie. Prabhupada said, especially we, we worship Radha Krishna in the mood of Lakshmi Narayana. To my knowledge, Prabhupada never, did he ever refer to worship of Radha Gopala? Uh, there is an early letter in which uh, he stated that we don't worship Radha Gopal, we worship Radha and Krishna together. Having said that, I believe yeah. uh, that uh, when, he, when he communicated with Sumati Muraji hmm. after he had come to New York, because right, she had yeah, sponsored yeah. this right, trip, right, right. she was a worshipper of Lakhu Gopal. And uh, Prabhupada said, we can make a nice temple for Lakhu Gopal. But yeah. he never, that was never pursued. Uh, Simati Muraji, I believe, is the follower of the Balava. Right, right. That's a mistake that's just been written that Vaishnavas don't worship Ladu Gopal. Gorya Vaishnavas Gorya. generally don't. Yeah. But the whole Balab Sampradaya is running on that. Yeah. Well, yes, it's, uh, it's not there, but for the Balab. Here in the uh, Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, they also have Santana Krishna, is a common name for men in. 
Tamil Nadu even today. And Managudi, they have that Rajagopal deity. People worship for the sake of having children. The Hari Bhakti Vibhasa, um, in its description of Janmashtami festival, it's, um, it's, it's the main focus of that description is on the, the activities that husband and wife can do to please the Lord in order to have children. That's that's uh, that tradition is there. You worship Krishna on Jamashtami day. So that is the day really for worshiping Madhi Gopal. So that's you know, everything is there, everything is included. Choose a question, or should I choose one for him? Okay. Yeah, I, I don't sit under a fan because of my throat, but they could have thought of the others. Can fan? No, that's it. If I have a fan, I tend to lose my voice very quickly. So, tolerate, tolerate this. Yeah, you, you just choose one question and then answer it. And then please give us the paper so we can choose our question. No, I already got one from you. Yeah, well, I just chose one. Okay. The prospective disciple is meant to select a spiritual master who can deliver and enlighten him, for he is currently deep in the darkness of ignorance. But if he is in ignorance, how can he effectively know if he's selecting a guru who represents the real truth? Guru and Krishna are the seers and the conditioned souls are the seen. How the conditioned soul can see or recognize the authentic guru? <clears throat> Omadhyan is for We have the information in the Shastra sufficient to tell us how to recognize a bona fide spiritual master. It's like when you want to purchase gold, or for that matter, if you have to make any important decision. Let's say if you want to buy a house, there's a lot of thought that has to go into that. There are standard procedures that we follow. And anyone who's not a fool will follow those standard procedures and educate himself enough to understand what has to be done and what, what should not be done. So if we read Srila Prabhupada's books very carefully, we can find sufficient information in them to help us to identify who is a bona fide spiritual master and who is not. But ultimately, there is a degree of subjectivity involved in that we have to make that decision. Do these qualities in here in this person or not? And we'll, we'll see that that differs from one person to the next. But the general information, as much as we can, depend on objective standards. Those standards are very um, thoroughly described throughout Shri Prabhupada's books. And if we want to buy gold, we don't just head for George Bazaar and buy the first thing that somebody shows us. We have to understand how do you test gold, what should be the price of gold? Where am I likely to get gold? You might want to take someone with you or someone 
may recommend to you who is a, a credible jeweler like this. So in the spiritual life it's also like that. We take shelter of the philosophy, we read Srila Prabhupada's books very carefully, we pray very hard, we consult with other devotees. Hare Krishna. We consult with other devotees who are senior and more experienced, and ultimately we make our decision. It's, it's just like that. Okay, do you want to go to the next one then? Because I, I, I had a long class this morning. Maybe a little, little air, air to me. If I honestly analyze myself, I can see that I have not yet become serious in spiritual life. I've been trying for several years, but I suffer from chronic non-seriousness. Why does this persist and what is the solution? How many of you feel like this sometimes? Uh, <laughs> so, it, that means it's a good, it's a, it's a relevant question. <laughs> and you're still here and you're still trying, I would take that as evidence that you are, at least to some degree, serious. Now the word serious is one of those elastic words. You can stretch it and squeeze it. Who is, you know, what counts as serious? Uh, how do you measure seriousness? Well, we do have some measures. Uh, for example, we have um, our practices, the do's and the don'ts. Uh, and if we're doing these basic practices and not doing the basic observances, the, the vidhi and the nishedha, things to be done, things not to be done, that's serious. And that's a lot more serious than any number of people who, like, um, who was it, were Zeppelin, when they heard the regular principles, mm. and stopped and said that's impossible. <laughs> mm. So, that's serious. Uh, a related word to serious is the English. And this was a term that as opposed to marble with holes in it which would be uh, filled up and so the marble dealers would free from wax so and that's similar to in ceramics, when you make something out of clay, if the clay has been thoroughly kneaded, you know this word knead to, like you knead uh, dough, you squeeze it. And, and what you're doing is getting out all the air bubbles. Because if there are air bubbles, then when you fire it in the kiln, when you put it into the oven to bake it, it'll crack and it'll explode. So this, you could say, is a, a nice analogy for spiritual life. The, the test of sincerity 
is that you keep going. We, there, there's a, an expression in English, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So the question includes how to um, how to find a solution to being uh, unserious. The solution is to keep going, and when some difficulty comes, face it. Face the difficulty. That is called courage. When difficulty comes, we feel fear. And when you have fear, and you turn around and run, then that's not so nice. If you have fear, and despite having fear, you face the difficulty, that is courage. Just, just, just stand on that and side. each okay. time yeah. you face even the small, the little daily difficulties, you are strengthening. It's like weightlifting. You're strengthening your determination, and that means you're strengthening, you're, you're manifesting your natural seriousness. As the eternal <laughs> servant of Krishna, by nature, you are sincere, you are serious. But in material life, what is there? There's covering of maya, there's distraction. We need to exercise the muscles of our spiritual identity. And that comes especially by facing difficulties. That's called tapasya. So I would just say, Keep going. Pray to Krishna. My dear Lord, look at me. I'm totally unserious. Just call me the original unserious devotee. Pray. <clears throat> Can you kindly do whatever is needed, whatever you think is necessary to make me serious? Now this is a dangerous prayer because Krishna may respond and he may immediately say, Oh, so you want me to <laughs> help you be serious? All right, hold on to your seat. But if you make that sincere prayer, whatever it is, whatever it takes, Krishna, let me have it, and let me recognize that when this challenge comes, this is when I have to, we say in English, taste the music. Kirtan. <laughs> Kirtan, yes. <laughs> okay. No kunda, where I go? And just find a new one. Situated, I guess it helps. I, I'm just guessing because I saw an S and a T and, and read it. Looks like probably means situated. Yeah, please go. There are three questions written here. The first one is to Guru Maharaj, so it's not me. The second one says Mukunda Dutta, so I'll take that question. In your class, you were explaining about reading Srila Prabhupada's books in the association. What should we do if we are not fortunate enough to have the association, or personal association, of senior devotees? These, these two points are one and different simultaneously. I was stressing this morning uh, the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books in the association of devotees whose faith is deeper than ours. 
um, and not to not to minimize the importance of that point, I would also like to remind you all that Srila Prabhupada himself said that everything is in his books and that he himself is in his books. So if we really dive into Srila Prabhupada's books as a regular daily practice, we will find that many of our problems and many of our doubts and questions, they'll be taken care of automatically by that process. As far as the I frustration know, that we may feel if we don't have the association of, be for you. or the personal association of senior devotions, I know one very yeah. valuable lesson that I learned from Tamal Krishna Goswami was that there are three things yeah, you yeah. can do if you're not fully satisfied with the association that you have. And these are in order of priority, in order of importance. The first thing and the best thing to do is to learn, somehow or other learn, how to better associate with the devotees and how to better appreciate the association that you've already got. At least one reason for that is that we understand that not a blade of grass waves in the breeze without the sanction of the Supreme Lord. And therefore we've been put into the particular association that we find ourselves in for some reason. Maybe we don't deserve better association. Maybe there are things that we have to learn from these individuals that we haven't yet recognized. But it's been my experience over the course of several decades that if we really dig deep enough and try to mine the gold in everyone else's heart, you will find so much there. Everyone who is chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and trying to follow this process has some inspiration that acts as, as the basis of their attachment, something that keeps them going on. We should try to understand what that is. And we can get a tremendous amount of inspiration from that. That's the first thing that we can do. And it's also the healthiest thing to do. Because it, it, it explicitly recognizes that all the bogies have great, great value within their hearts. <clears throat> the second thing that we might do especially nowadays, it's, it's much easier to do than it's ever been before, is to proactively seek out whatever association we feel we need from wherever it's available. If we have to go somewhere to find it, then we can do that. Like we've, we've all come to this Shravanam Kirtanam camp with that intention. Or we can just push a, a few buttons and everything is available on the internet it's, it's so easy to get association now. Even if you don't have a personal association of the devotees, you can, you can do pretty well over the internet. I actually know one retired householder couple in Los Angeles, and they have their nice, comfortable house in the suburbs, and they have their big flat screen television there, and they have somehow worked it out that they, they've got it hooked up in such a way that the television broadcasts the morning program from one temple after another all the way around the world in sequence. So that 24 hours a day, they're experiencing satsanga via the internet. It's, it's possible to do these things nowadays, and it wasn't possible 30 or 40 years ago to do these things. So that's a great blessing for us. And it's probably a result of nearly half a century of Sankirtan performed by the members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. We call that, uh, well, Rupa Goswami says that even in Sadhana Bhakti we get the destruction of all miseries and the production of all auspiciousness. So that's the second thing we can do. We can proactively seek out whatever association we we desire. And the third thing that we can do is definitely not so easy to do, but it is an option that we see in the personal example of Srila Prabhupada. 
Jinnah Pearl Club found in the late 1930s and 1940s and 50s and 60s that his god brothers were not particularly serious about executing the clear instructions of their spiritual master. And instead they were very serious about fighting one another over the assets of the Gaudi Mat. And so he was dissatisfied with the, with the spiritual association that he had. What he did as an alternative is that he, he did whatever he had to do to create the association that he wanted. And that's why we're all sitting here today. So I said in the beginning, these are in order of importance. The last one is, is not something we can expect or should encourage. The second one is okay, but really the best thing to do is that if we don't have the association of senior devotees, personal association, we, we can somehow or other try to better appreciate whatever association we do have because you never actually know who you're sitting next to and you never actually know just how deep their Krishna consciousness is. Sometimes we get some revelation, but quite often we never, we never know. We may be sitting next to great Mahatmas, and we are sitting next to great Mahatmas, but we have to re recognize that, we have to realize it. That's, that's what I can say about this. Maybe somebody else can add. Okay, uh, question is how, how to correct the mistake of a devotee senior to myself? Uh, well, in such a case it's best to consult with devotees who are on the level of that devotee who's senior to yourself and express your concerns to them. They may, the, the devotees who you consult, they may uh, explain to you or that maybe your concerns are not as valid as you thought they were, or they may take it up to themselves speak to that. that, that devotee, that's the best way if you feel that something really needs to be corrected. It, uh, you can try like that. That's, that's the best thing to do, in such a case. Okay, that's, I don't really have much more to say about that. Yeah, please. I think, uh, I think we have to also consider what constitutes a mistake. Uh, what we might think is a mistake, might be a mistake, then again, it might not be a mistake. Uh, what means mistake? Of course, there can be glaring faults, uh, but also you know, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is, is, is saying <laughs> that with every kind of endeavor there will be faults. Is it uh, Sadosham Apinatya Jet. Sadosham Apinatya Jet. Sarvaram Bahidu Shaina. Anyway, Krishna's, Krishna's point is that's more for oneself because you might be thinking, oh, I can't. Yes, I'll make a mistake so that I don't do it. No, Krishna says, you do it, <laughs> it's your duty, uh, even you may do a mistake. Anyway, the general point is, what, what, what means mistake? Um, you know, someone may do something which is not what is the consequence of a mistake? I think this is the question to ask. Is it enough serious that it needs attention? Is it a disturbance to the other devotees? 
uh, or, or is it just uh, uh, an idiosyncrasy of that particular world? So many factors in there. Yeah. Oh, what's your, what's your question? Mm -hmm. It is observed sometimes, note the classic case, it is observed sometimes that when relatively young devotee gives a few classes or lectures, two phenomena occur. One, he thinks himself to be a senior preacher the Guruji symptom, and second, the congregation overestimates him, and thus he is under illusion. So that's just describing a situation. I guess the question is what to do about it. Um, it might be that this is something not for you to do anything about, not to worry about. <laughs> you know, the less you worry about other people's uh, pride, the less chance you're going to be overcome by pride. <laughs> That's one point. Uh, I remember uh, reading Guru Das Prabhu. My god brother, our god brother was uh, in Vrindavan. And Srila Prabhupada was also there, Krishna Balaraman. And Srila Prabhupada instructed some of his senior devotees to give class in the evening. And Srila Prabhupada would attend the class. Now just imagine that situation. You've been instructed. Do you sometimes sit in your disciples' class? Uh, sometimes outside. Uh -huh. They don't sit. And then I... Well, imagine how intimidated... I, I can listen on the recordings also. Yeah, yes. That, that I do more of. Yes. The, be, be the warm. guru listens to the be recording warm. of your lecture. So, make it think twice. Anyway, uh, Prabhupada instructed that I want you each, each evening to get class. So the devotees were furiously preparing themselves, memorizing shlokas, as, as they could, and then they would get class. Then it was Gurudas Prabhu's turn. And Gurudas was not a person to memorize shlokas. For him to memorize a verse, you know, how many lifetimes? He, he just, that wasn't his thing. But it was his turn, he had to give class. So he gave class. And after he was finished, he went over to Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, very nice class. Now I can retire. <laughs> and Durga said, uh, oh, are you serious? <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, and even Pishima liked your class. <laughs> Prabhupada's sister. And Durga said, but Pishima doesn't understand English. <laughs> oh yes, she understood enough. And she liked your class. And again, Prabhupada said, so now I can retire. And then a third time, just to really emphasize the point that because he was speaking basic teaching of Bhagavad Gita, but, you know, following Guru Parampara, Prabhupada was satisfied. So from that perspective, we may say, a person may, may feel a little bit proud, look at me, I'm, I'm giving a lecture, and now everyone's bowing down to me. Of course, Prabhupada also said one time, um, how was it? There was some discussion about who is advanced. And Prabhupada said, advanced? Advanced? Who is advanced? Narada Muni, he is advanced. So, everything in proper perspective. But the fact that uh, 
a devotee is sincerely trying to uh, to speak on Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Shiva Prabhupada's books, that's we should appreciate that and at the same time help devotees not to get overinflated. Uh, one way to do that is ask the question that he or she cannot answer. Stump the swami. Stump the swami. <laughs> But, you know, we're, we're not a debating society. Um, better is to, uh, uh, as Mukunda Dr. Prabhu was saying, <laughs> be aware that we may not know who we are sitting next to or, or standing next to. Uh, this person may very well be a Mahat Mahatma uh, with great potential. Another point I would make is that this is something uh, that may, in course of time, be, uh, be developed in our society. In the Christian tradition, they have, in the training of their priests, uh, a, a course, a program called homiletics. That means that the, uh, the priests, those becoming priests, are being trained in a very systematic way how to give a lecture, how to preach. I think that's something that uh, we can also learn. Now, 6.15 was given as the time for the evening Odyssey. Was it 6.15? Yeah? Six thirty. And did we decide if we're gonna go through and have a long kirtan or have a class afterwards? Did we ever come to any decision on that? There'll be a class. Okay. So six thirty to seven thirty kirtan and then Maharaj will give a class. So please, I'm going to go. Yeah. yeah. I like to invite my family, people into Islam. I feel it very difficult to convey my message. Please say an easy way to involve them in Islam. This is a very good question, and it's enough sound. It's a question that we have to deal with any number of times. I think pretty much without exception, the first thing every devotee wants to do when they come to ISKCON is make everyone Krishna conscious, <laughs> and especially to share it with your family members. We were discussing a little bit this morning that when you have knowledge, that you've just found some knowledge and you want to share it with other people, you may find that they don't appreciate it. They're not interested, or they don't understand, or they resent it somehow. So, it's usual for people new to Christian consciousness in particular to try to try to convert everyone around them, especially their family members, and it's also usual that that effort fails. So what to do? What is the easy way? This is the question. In my opinion, for what it's worth, the easy way or the, the optimal way of dealing with this is that instead of directly trying to preach to people who may or may not be sympathetic, especially family members who see you in a certain way and will always see you in a certain way. The better thing is to just engage them somehow in ways that they do appreciate. And gradually when they become purified by that engagement in devotional service, then they may actually develop enough piety and interest in Krishna consciousness that they, they inquire submissively, which is the real beginning. 
of Krishna consciousness. But it, it usually doesn't happen in the beginning. That when we try to preach to people that they're going to uh, appreciate it, it usually doesn't happen. And even if someone is faithful and has potential for Krishna consciousness, we ourselves also are very new to Krishna consciousness and we need to we need to develop the very fine art of how to communicate to another person the your own experience in Krishna consciousness. So there are different ways to do that. Um, directly preaching to someone, uh, explicitly preaching to someone is maybe the least effective way. I know that with from my own experience, I I had to go home and spend some time with my mother because when she became old, she was invalid. And I had to take care of her until she died. So by that time, I was many decades in Krishna consciousness, and so I knew better than to try to preach to her directly. So instead, I was just engaging her at every opportunity. I was, she was invalid, so I had to cook for her. Because I was cooking for her anyway, I would cook prasadam for her and give her prasadam. Every day for some four or five years, she had prasadam. And I would, because she was invalid, she welcomed any opportunity to go out. And so she didn't have any hesitation when I took her to the temple. And she liked it. Although she wasn't interested in taking up Krishna consciousness, she wasn't anything close to being a Hindu, wasn't even particularly religious, but she appreciated the experience. She had a positive experience. You have to you have to empathize with people on the mental platform. You have to try to try to empathize with them. Empathize means to see through their perspective, or rather through their mind's perspective, what kind of experience they're going to have with whatever you're presenting to them. Prasadam is a short fire way to bring people to Krishna consciousness. I've seen this over many years. Um, it works. Uh, it may take some time, but it, it, it definitely works. Anyway, in my mother's case, because of many years of doing these kinds of things for her, and never even once trying to actually preach to her, even though I knew she was dying, and I knew all about the philosophy that birth, death, old age, and disease, I didn't share any of this with her because I could see that she wasn't ready for it. When we ourselves are new in Krishna consciousness, we don't see that because we're not experienced or wise enough. But somehow or other, I have that insight. And I think because I never tried to push anything upon her, she actually became increasingly favorable as it came close to death. Such that in her end days, um, she had Tulsi neck beads on her neck and she was wearing Vaishnava Tilak. The last thing that she ate was Mahaprasadam offered at Mangalarti to their lordship Sri Sri Bhakti Dvarakadish. And among her last words before she fell into a coma were Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And she had been eating Prasadam at that point for four years, constantly. And she had been hearing from Srila Prabhupada, and she had gone to the temple, and she met Indaduna Swami, and she also met Giriraj uh, Swami and other devotees. She had a very positive experience, and I think as a result, she was able to go very peacefully. My point is that it's, it's much more than I ever expected would be possible for her. And it's, I think, largely due to the fact that I didn't try to push her, because Especially Americans, you can't really push them to do anything they don't want to do. With Indians, it's maybe different, but I, I know enough about India. Uh, there's a question. Atheists and non-devotees challenge the authority of scriptures, stating that these are written by someone and fall into the category of Itihas or Smriti. I think I'm getting a bit mixed up here. Whoever's asking the question. Um, between Ved Aparu Shayadva is one thing, and then the authority of Shruti as compared to Smriti. How to convince them that the Vedas and Puranas are authentic and coming from 
Krishna directly? It seems like there are two classes of questions here. One is the authority of the Vedas, it being not, uh, not coming from any person in the sense that uh, yeah, not any material person, not, not orig originating at any time from any mundane mind. And then the other thing is the uh, point about the authority of the Puranas comparing with that of the Shruti. <clears throat> How to convince them? Well, you can give good arguments, but those who want to argue will go on and on and on and on forever. And these questions will go on and on and on forever, because the, the Vedas are eternal. And the phenomenon of people not wanting to accept the Vedas is also eternal. It's called Hinduism. <laughs> or directly or indirectly. There are those who say they accept the authority, but they don't accept Bhagavad Gita as it is. In India people have to be more uh, resourceful or chalu, what's the cunning, cunning, to avoid Krishna. It's more difficult to avoid Krishna. In the West, you don't have to bother you know, about all these things, but of course, that's what we call Vedic culture. Vedic culture is what is going on in the name of Hinduism is an elaborate arrangement for forgetting Krishna. Uh, real Vedic culture means that which uplifts one toward Krishna. But because the demons want to avoid Krishna. They come up with so many different arguments. Now this is a very important question. Maybe more important than the questioner realized because the whole basis of everything that we're doing in Krishna consciousness is based on the acceptance of the authority of the Vedas. <clears throat> which means that we accept they are a Purusheya, they don't originate in any person. Although it is said, Veda Narayana Sakshat, the Vedas directly emanate from Narayana, and they, uh, they emanate from his breathing and from time to time of Mahavishnu, and he, he instructs Brahma, each Brahma in each universe, in the knowledge of the Vedas, and from time to time the Vedas get lost or stolen and he restores them. The knowledge is lost and he comes again and he speaks Bhagavad Gita. You know the verses. It gets lost in course of time. Uh, uh, but on the other hand it's Aparushaya. Which means that he doesn't have any origin. How can we understand that? Uh, understand it. what is knowledge? Knowledge is knowledge concerning something. So the something or the some idea or whatever it is and the knowledge about it, they are simultaneously existing but they're not exactly the same. This is a piece of paper. Right? Everyone gets a piece of paper. So, the existence of the paper and what it is and knowledge about it, they're not exactly the same thing, but they simultaneously exist. They, as long as there is consciousness to observe the paper or feel it or analyze it in various ways, uh, then there is knowledge. And because we accept that consciousness is eternal, there is all-pervading consciousness, that of the Supreme Lord, 
Therefore, if a tree falls down in a forest and there's no one there to see it, it still falls down. That's a philosophical proposition or conundrum. If a tree falls down in a forest and no one sees it, does, can we really say it fell down? Because there's no one to say it fell down. But Krishna sees it. So yes, the tree falls down. Uh, personally, for several years, I, do you remember we had a philosophical discussion in Baroda once we called Vidvan Goranga for this? Uh, this has... I, I've been concerned with this very question for several years that we at some point in time if and when our Krishna consciousness movement uh, rises up to its potential and starts to become prominent then these kind of questions are going to be raised Buddhism and Jainism among others Charvakism, they all, they all begin with rejection of the Vedas. There's specific, there's specific, uh, we say Charvak is atheism, but it's specifically rejecting the Vedas because the, the Vedic knowledge and culture is the whole basis of life, of everything in India. It was just presumed, even Buddha, the Buddha, he gave some philosophy which rejected the Vedas but at the same time he didn't question the Vedic worldview of various planetary systems and hells and karma and he didn't, he didn't reject that, he just we can say he maybe didn't even think of anything different, Charvak did Charvak rejected the idea of reincarnation but it's all rebellion against the, the, the understanding or the, the implicit acceptance of Veda as being knowledge. So it is, a, there must be a great body of philosophical back and forth, the objections which are raised. A simple objection is given here in this question, is that as, as Buddhists make, is well, if something's written, someone must have written it. But it doesn't really answer, it, it does, it's not really a valid, uh, if we accept the Vedic position, it's not really a valid objection, because if I tell you something and then you write it down, then you're not the author of that. So, although the Vedas were written down at some point in time, it doesn't mean that the person who wrote them invented them. So it's a... It's a I, I've seen Buddhist arguments. They're really, really not... Not very, not very good at all, actually. Maybe I'm going to talk on some of them. But they're really not very strong points, but uh, strong enough to attract a lot of people to the uh, Buddhist camp. So how can we convince people that the Vedas are true? It's really a matter of faith. It has a kind of faith. It comes down to faith. People may believe it or not believe it. And if they're inclined not to believe it, it's difficult to convince them. It, then it takes a purification of consciousness. Srila Prabhupada often said, do kirtan and Dishuva Prasad, then you speak philosophy, when they become somewhat purified and submissive and ready to listen. Because, because the whole platform of knowledge in the modern world is one reason why I'm very much against mundane education. Not just that because Srila Prabhupada was against it, and there's a very good reason why Prabhupada is against it. We say it's atheistic, 
Well, one reason is it's based on the premise. It's not even taught what the premise is. But the premise is that knowledge is something that we as humans, we gain it by observing phenomena and then hypothesizing or speculating about it. <clears throat> and this, the, the very approach is atheistic. Because the godly approach, or to accept that there is God and there is knowledge and God gives us knowledge. That is the theistic approach. We can give arguments for that also. If we start from saying, okay, I am sitting here in a big universe, I don't know how big it is, I'm very small, I have very limited intelligence. I don't know why I'm here, what's going on, why, why I'm here. There must be some reason, if we, even, if we start to think like that, that's the beginning of actual use of human intelligence. And then if we think that, well then, there's some, there must be some reason, I can't work it out. Everything we do is with some purpose, so there must be some ultimate purpose. Uh, there's a huge universe and it's running on, there must be some controller. Uh, it's a big, big topic, I, it's not a two minute answer. This piece of paper came into being by random interaction of chemicals. Any takers? Anyone? No. It required... If we consider how much intelligence went into this little piece of paper to produce this, the refinement of the paper production process over the centuries, finding out which trees, presumably this is tree wood paper, most nowadays is, but can be made from rice husks and different things also. And throw away clothes, you can make paper from that also. But presumably this is from a tree, what kind of tree, and then the whole forestry, which kind of trees to plant, and then in which climate, in which soil, and then the whole legalities of, uh, of uh, making the factory in certain place, zones. You could spend your whole life, and you still wouldn't come to the end, if you just tried to understand everything behind this piece of paper. <clears throat> so, this piece of paper, there's so much went into it. And we say the whole universe comes into being without a satyam apatishtam te jagada huranishtam. There's no God, it's just, it's just there. So, if one is actually intelligent, actually it's not even a question of intelligence, it's just a matter of being sane, that's all. As I just heard Srila Prabhupada say in a recording, that only an, only an insane person cannot believe in God. It doesn't make any sense. So, okay, all right, so I'm sitting here. There must be someone who put it all together for some reason. I don't know what that is. So, he must, it's reasonable, we're starting from the bottom up here. I was talking about that philosophy country. It's reasonable to accept that there is knowledge of what we are supposed to be doing and why we're suffering and why we can get free from suffering and that God, it's reasonable to accept there is God and that there is a method to get this knowledge and that is revealed knowledge and we can accept them as the Vedas. But people who are impious at every step they'll make objections. So it's we can give these arguments and there'll be counter-arguments and it will go on forever. 
Well, that, that's a brief outline, and I, if anyone wants to get into it, I'd like to get into it, to make a f philosophical step-by-step -step construct of how we establish the validity of Vedic knowledge. But they can't, you can start from the bottom, but eventually you have to say, okay, this is as far as I get by logic, and then we have to accept there is knowledge, given by God, the knowledge of God, it's the knowledge of the Veda means eternal because Krishna is eternal, we are eternal so knowledge concerning that is eternal it comes some point where you have to accept knowledge from a higher source otherwise if we see philosophy and science it just goes on and on and on, generation after generation, with more and more subtleties and not going anywhere, round and round, not going up. Ah. So it is a great project to present this step by step, how ah. we have to accept Vedic knowledge or accept revelation from God as being valid. And then there are, uh, well, when someone may say, well, we accept the Quran. And someone say, we accept the Christian by the, by the Bible. If someone says to me, I believe in the Bible, I say, which Bible? There are various versions. And they may say,